So today, guys, we are going to talk about how we get to China of today. All right, we talked about China in the 1800s earlier in the year, and now we're going to use those events as like historical circumstances for how China is now and why they pursued the path of communism and how communism in China has evolved since the late 1970s into what it is now. It's kind of a weird place in, in, in that their, their government and how they run it is very communist, but their economy is very, very capitalist now, kind of like a, a hybrid situation. So let's review a little bit, and then we'll talk about how China becomes communist. Does anybody remember what the word imperialism means? Okay, one country conquers land in another part of the world in order to acquire natural resources. So let's put that in our documents. What else were they looking for in addition to natural resources? This idea that I, if I acquire more land, I can kind of get the people there to buy my stuff. Rhymes with true farkets. New, new, and new markets for manufactured goods. Okay, it's, it's economics speak for this idea that you're gonna have more people around that are gonna buy your stuff. It's very important, it's, it's one thing to mass produce things in your factories, it's another thing to make sure that there's gonna be a supply of people there that are gonna be buying your stuff. Like when the iPhone came out, people were often surprised that the iPhone wasn't sold in China. It was made there, but not sold there. The Chinese government was kind of hesitant in allowing that because, you know, if there's internet on it, they would have to, if it's communism, right, censor it and make sure that they would be able to clamp down on it if necessary. Um, so eventually they were able to sell it there, but it took, some, it took some working. Okay, cool. So if you remember, right, the British went to China and the British are like, hey, we keep buying stuff from China, so all of our money is going there, but the Chinese aren't buying anything from us. So the British are like, we gotta find something that the Chinese people are willing to buy. Do you guys remember what that thing was? Opium, okay? So a war is fought over opium, right? Because the Chinese government was like, we don't want this stuff here. And the British are like, well, too bad. We're smuggling it anyway. So a war broke out, okay? So what was one cause of the opium war? The Chinese government tried to stop Britain from smuggling opium into China. It was a drug war. Does anybody remember which side won that conflict and why? The British, yeah. Okay, Britain won, okay, and we had a very common theme, right? Whenever it was the 1800s and it was a European country versus an Asian country, pretty much every single time the European country won, with rare exceptions. Why? The general broad answer. Exactly, right? It's superior military technology. China made kind of a conscious decision in the 1600s that it was going to kind of limit contact with Europeans. They thought maybe Europeans and their culture would be a threat to China, right? So when you don't trade with the Europeans, you don't get ideas. And when the Europeans go through the Industrial Revolution, China does not do that. So when the two sides meet in battles, even though the country of China had three times, maybe four times the amount of people, Britain still won. Their ships had iron um, armor. They had steam engines on them versus the Chinese sailing vessels. Okay, it was no contest. And as a result, China is affected greatly by that. Does anybody remember some of the ways that China was impacted from the Opium War? They lost that piece of land, that city. It rhymes with Tong Kong. <laughs> yes. China forced to give Britain Hong Kong. Okay, and they gave it back to China in 1997. I remember that was a big deal. I, I got wind of it when I was in the sixth grade. And China promised it would allow the people of Hong Kong to have democracy and freedom for 50 years. And now we're seeing China kind of going back on that and the people of Hong Kong like rebelling in the streets over it. And some of them are trying to sneak out of China and go to Taiwan where they have democracy. Anybody remember anything else that happened to China? Spheres of influence. Let's take a look at what that is. So if I were to show you what China looked like in the late 1800s, you'd see a lot of colors there. Does anybody remember what spheres of influence meant? Okay, so in these colored areas, with, with some exceptions, generally speaking, like if you look at here, the, the British spheres, okay, so like the light green right here along, uh, along the, uh, the Yangtze River, this is not land that the British government controlled directly. China, its government, the Qing government, the Qing dynasty was still in charge, 
But when the British were here, they controlled all the trade. So what that means is they forced the Chinese people living here to buy British made goods and they don't allow goods from other countries to be sold there. It's a way to guarantee a market for British made products. The, Brit the British love it, but the Chinese hate it, right? Because they don't have freedom anymore as a consumer. They can't buy stuff from their own people. They can't buy stuff from France or from America. But Britain makes out like a bandit. Right? So this is kind of a slap in the face to China. If you're not sure where Hong Kong is, it's right here, off the southern portion of China here. And if you're the British, that's a super great strategic location because it's right on the sea. Right? If you're looking to import and export things out of China, that's a great location. And of course, here is Taiwan. Okay, so the 1800s did not really go well for China. Let's just add that part about spheres of influence, okay? China carved up into spheres of influence by European nations. It didn't go well for China in the 1800s, and the Chinese people were ticked off. They were ticked off with two things. They were ticked off that Europeans were running around their country, and many of them were not subject to Chinese laws anymore, right? They only had to follow the laws of their home country, right? So imagine you're living in a country, and there's a British person running around, and that person does not have to follow the same laws you have to follow. You'd be pretty upset, okay? So they're upset with foreigners, but they're also upset with their own government because they see that their government failed them. Like, wait a second, I thought we're China. We're like the world superpower. How come we keep losing these wars? We've got m many, many more people. This is ridiculous. Obviously, this government is weak. It's terrible. We got to get rid of it and bring in somebody new. Do you guys remember the name of one of those rebellions that broke out against the foreigners and the government? They made a whole movie about it. It's called Rocky. The Boxer Rebellion broke out. And there was another one. Taiping Rebellion started. Both were suppressed, okay? They were not successful, but they weakened the government and weakened the government. And eventually you get into the 1900s and early in the 1900s, it's like barely anything left of the Qing dynasty. That's kind of be where we pick off around the year 1911 and go to literally the present day in this unit. Okay, so China gets its butt kicked in the Opium War. The foreigners are dominating China and the Chinese people have had it. They want to see their country be strong. They have pride in their long-standing Chinese culture. They don't want to see the country be weak. They don't want to see the country being dominated by somebody else. So a movement grows, a movement that represents people having pride and want to see their country be strong. What movement might I be referring to? Nationalist movement. Nationalist movement in China begins. What we're going to do today, guys, is something a little bit different, because what we're going to do is I'm going to basically lecture a little bit, which is kind of old school, all right? And tomorrow you're going to take a multiple choice quiz based on what we're going to be learning about right now. So you have two things. You have this PowerPoint slides, and this is like instead of making you guys fill in the blanks in like an outline, I'm just giving you all the notes and we're going to talk about it and, I'm going to, and we're going to have some kind of a discussion here. But in your handout, I gave you this space where you might want to take down like an additional notes about things that come up that you didn't remember that we're going to review. Like for instance, I, I guarantee you there's got to be at least one person out there who didn't remember what nationalism means, right? Nationalism, pride in one's country. If you didn't remember that, maybe it's a good opportunity to write that down here. And I'll stop and prompt you guys and ask you those kinds of review questions. And again, if you don't remember those things, put down those definitions here. It might be beneficial to you when you take your multiple choice quiz on this tomorrow. This is optional, but I just want you to have this space in case you feel like you need to take some notes because not everyone remembers everything from the past. All right, so I'm gonna turn my attention to this and you have this as well and you can always pull up your slides. You can always do a file, make a copy, have your own copy of it and you can also type notes directly into the PowerPoint if that's something you'd be down for. Okay guys, so like we said, a nationalist movement develops in China. The name of the nationalist group, I'm never gonna ask you, oh, what was the name of the Chinese nationalist group? The Kuomintang is that group. If you could just remember that the Kuomintang are the Chinese nationalists, you're gonna be good to go. And the guy who led that group of people who wanted a stronger China is this guy, Sun Yixian. Okay, pardon me if my pronunciations are a little bit off. I'm, I, I'm trying to make sure that they're accurate. Okay, he and his group of nationalists put the nail in the coffin on that Qing dynasty, right? So that group of, that government that was in charge, that the Boxer Rebellion was rebelling against, the Taiping Rebellion, finally in 1911, they're gone. And this guy says, all right, we're gonna build a new China that's gonna be modern and Western, just like the Japanese did during the Meiji Restoration. He comes up with these 
three basic principles for Chinese people. This is like are his like big broad goals for what the country should be like. Nationalism and an end to foreign control of China. What's nationalism again? Pride in one's country, right? If you have pride, and if you have pride in your country, you want to see it be strong. Democracy and the protection of rights for Chinese people. I'm gonna get scared for a second, but does anyone know what democracy means? So in a democracy, people can participate in their government. That's what you, that's what you probably wanna write down. And we're different types, right? In America, we have representative democracy where we pick the leaders who then make the laws for us. But generally speaking, democracy, people have the right to participate in the government, right? If they're citizens of voting age. So this Sun Yixian guy wants China to have that, which we take for granted, but they never ever had that in China, right? Since China was founded, it's dynastic rule. It's an emperor, an empire, and rule passed from father to eldest son. That's old school, right? So in 1911, he's like, all right, we're gonna make China just like the West just like the Japanese went about it in that way as well. He also wanted economic security for the Chinese people. Any idea what he meant by like economic security? Like what's, what's economic or economics? Money stuff, right? So I'm secure in my finances. That's what economic security means. So what has to exist in a country in order to get yourself economic security? Money, and how does one acquire that? Job opportunities, exactly, right? So the guy wants China to be strong, I and mean, he's not really saying how in this, but these are his broad goals, right? A strong country, people should be able to vote for their leaders, and there should be plenty of job opportunities, right? So he's probably thinking in terms of industrialization, right? Let's get some of those factories here, and that'll employ people. So that's all well and good, and he had the support of the people with those principles, but then something happens that alters the course of people's support for the Kuomintang, the Chinese Nationalist Party. China in World War I sided with the British and the French. China's figuring, since it was part of the winning side, that it would benefit from that. So if you were to look back at this map, there were some parts of China that were directly controlled by European powers. These, this red chunk right here became German-held territory in China during that period of imperialism in China. So China's thinking, oh, we beat the Germans in World War I. We're on the side of the British and the French. So obviously this land will be turned back over to us. But instead, the British and the French in the Treaty of Versailles make another mistake, and they gave this land to Japan. So China's thinking, wait, well, man, it's, it's 1919, and we still don't have control over ourselves. Still, foreign countries determine the fate of us. Obviously, whatever we're doing is not good enough. So the Chinese Nationalist Party, ineffective. We need something new to make the country stronger. Enter another guy, this guy Mao Zedong, and the communists. So maybe you guys could think about this for a second critically. What do you remember about communism just in general? Tell me, like remind me. Okay, great Taylor, right? There's no private property in communism, right? The government owns all the land. No private property. Good, government controls all the businesses. Excellent. What's the goal for communist leadership? What are they trying to create in society? A classless society, excellent, right? No social classes. They're, they don't want any rich, they don't want any poor, they want everyone to be the same. Idea being, if everyone's the same, there is no violence, there's no conflict, there's no more crime. Okay, so let me ask you this now. If in communism, the government owns and operates all the businesses, how could that, in theory, make that government more powerful? What could it tell those businesses to do? Okay, maybe the government could tell the businesses, hey, Raise your prices and we'll raise taxes and then we'll take your money and we'll benefit in that way. Good call, absolutely. What else? Let's take another tangent for a second. Take a look at this. Apparently, this is coming out soon. There's going to be a Snapchat selfie drone. This is a real thing. A flying Snapchat selfie machine so you can get the, the proper forehead selfie angle, so you can keep your streaks going every single time. Does this benefit the government in any way? Because they could, they could like keep track of all of our faces and watch where we're going. That's true. It kind of looks like, if you look at it, it kind of looks like it can make waffles too, which is kind of cool. Like I would love a drone that just flew around and delivered me waffles. I'd be all about that. All right, my point that I'm trying to make with this is that in a capitalist society, 
right? Businesses are controlled by regular everyday people, everyday regular everyday people who are uh, trying to obtain a profit. So they're going to make things that they think people will buy. I don't know if anyone's going to buy this. We'll see what happens. In a communist society, profit does not exist. That incentive does not exist anywhere. So the government is going to tell the businesses, produce stuff that we can use to defend the country. So it'll tell the businesses, we don't care about the Snapchat drone. You're going to now make machine guns. We don't care about the Ford Model T. Make a tank that people can walk to work. They could take a selfie old school with their arm. We don't need the drone. So some people decided, oh, look at the Soviet Union. Look how powerful they became in such a short period of time under communism. Why? Because the government controls people's minds. So it can encourage them to support that government. And it could tell the businesses to produce weapons and things necessary to make the country stronger. So a lot of people figure maybe communism now is a better solution. And maybe the Soviet Union could be a better ally than America, Britain, and France, because America, Britain, and France kind of backstabbed them after World War I. Okay? So China, just like the Soviet Union, was an agrarian nation. And agrarian means the same thing as kind of like agriculture. Maybe it's something we should write down if we don't remember what agriculture means. Farming, okay? Agriculture is farming. Agrarian nation is a country where most people are employed in agriculture. Like that's like most people, what they do for a living is they farm things. That's what we mean by agrarian nation. So just like the Soviet Union, you're not gonna have this mass rebellion of factory workers, right? Karl Marx was the communist guy who predicted that the proletariat, right? The poor factory workers would overthrow everything. Well, you don't have that in China. You just have poor peasant farmers. So instead, if there was going to be a revolution for communism, it would have to be led by someone who uh, had some money, who was middle class, who had some kind of an education, who could bring people together. Vladimir Lenin was that person in Russia. Fidel Castro was that person in Cuba. Ho Chi Minh was that person in Vietnam. Mao Zedong is going to be that person for China. Just to make some comparisons again, do you guys remember when Vladimir Lenin went around Russia promising people so that they would join his side? Peace, land, and bread. It's going to be very, very similar for Mao Zedong. Okay, Mao Zedong is going to promise people, similarly, food production increases, right? The, the bread metaphor, if you will. But also, he's going to promise Chinese people to increase their literacy. Do you guys remember what literacy means? When you can read and write. Right? That's typically a goal of communist societies is to get people reading and writing better. You saw that with Cuba, right? In your homework assignment last week, even though the country is poor, 99% of Cuban people can read and write. So Mao, Mao Zedong is going around telling Chinese peasants, hey, I'm going to give you land. We're going to take it from the rich people and give it to you. We're going to improve the way this country produces food so they don't starve to death anymore. And I'm going to put resources into education so that you can go out and get a job because you can read and write. Because on the farms, maybe you weren't learning how to do that. Okay? At this point, the person in charge of the nationalist group, right, the Sunni Xi'an guy is replaced by another guy called Chiang Kai-shek. Sometimes he's referred to as Jiang Ji-shi. Personally, I'm not exactly sure why. He's got two different names. We'll, we'll try to find that out another time. And in the beginning, you've got conflict between the two sides because there's always going to be some people who don't want communism to be successful. And we've talked about this. Which people tend to resist communism in a country? The rich people. How come? Government's going to take away all the stuff, right? You, you are a person of wealth. You have money. You have property. You have possessions. If communism works out, all that stuff is gone, okay? So it's not like everybody was in tune with communism. There were rich people in China who resisted that. But there were a lot of angry poor people as well, poor people who were not very well supplied, so they had to resort to guerrilla warfare, right? Using those sneak attacks, right? Not confronting your enemy head on. Um, and eventually... The nationalists, at least in the beginning, in 1934, they are on the winning side of this civil war. Okay, in fact, they at one point surrounded like the base for all the communists where they existed, and they forced the communists to kind of retreat out of southern China. And they went through this period of time called the Long March for like about a year. Communists like trekked through all throughout China, going from south to north to try to like rebuild themselves. Um, and that's kind of an important moment in Chinese history because that's when Mao Zedong kind of emerges as like this undisputed leader of the poor Chinese people, the communists, because he's the one that kind of organized this mass retreat. He became kind of like this like folk, like legend in folklore. Like, oh, Mao Zedong is the person who saved communism from, from destruction. He was the one who was able to organize our retreat. 
So he kind of built up this following of people during this mass escape. And eventually, um, once he starts receiving support from the Soviet Union, he would be successful in overthrowing um, the nationalists. So in China, in the early 1900s, you had a civil war breakout between communists, led by this guy Mao Zedong, and the Nationalist Party, okay, who were going to associate with this leader, Jiang Zixi. Okay, the nationalists were the non-communist group. So two sides within a country at war with each other. Civil war. Could somebody remind me about where we left off yesterday? I, asked, I think I asked you guys the question, like, which social class typically resists communism? How come? Because the government's gonna take away all the stuff. Likewise, the poor typically, not always, but sometimes the poor support communism because they're promised to get something when they don't have anything. If you're poor and you're desperate, you're gonna listen to people when they say, we're gonna give you stuff, okay? Even if they might be a little bit crazy, it might take away all your political freedoms. So a civil war breaks out. And even though typically in societies there are more poor than rich, the communists weren't doing so well in the beginning because the non-communists were getting some support from outside countries. Take a guess, right? It's the 1900s. There's a group of people in a country fighting against communists. We've been talking about this a lot. Who's going to have their back? The United States is going to have their back. So even though they were outnumbered, perhaps, the non-communists had the support. And there was a brief moment in time where it looked like the communist movement was going to be squashed completely in China. Okay, Mao Zedong and his people were surrounded in, in a, I forget ex the exact name of the town, it's not important for our, our lesson here, surrounded completely, okay, and Mao kind of made himself to, like, to be almost like a legend in a lot of ways for the Chinese communists, but he, because he found ways to kind of sneak his people out of that city and split them up into like three or four different groups and migrate out of southern China and reassemble in the north where they rebuilt themselves, reorganized, and then got the support of the Soviet Union. So people kind of celebrate this long march in Chinese history because it's when Mao, Mao Zedong kind of asserts himself as like the de facto leader of the Chinese communist movement and kind of saved it. Because if he wasn't able to sneak people out, there probably wouldn't be a Chinese communist party or a Chinese, uh, a Chinese party uh, and Chinese government today that's run by communism. Okay, so successful and that he was able to get them to escape. And eventually, since the communists would be supported by the Soviet Union, they would win, okay? For a very, very brief moment in the 1930s when Japan invaded China, the communists and the non-communists put aside their differences to fight the Japanese. But when World War II was over, they went right back at it, okay? And the communists win. China becomes a communist country in 1949. And the losers, the Nationalist Party, they retreated to Taiwan. And this is why today Taiwan considers itself an independent country, it's capitalist, it's democratic, because it goes back to this time period in which the non-communists escaped to Taiwan. And literally, ever since 1949, China's like, that's just an island off the coast of China. It belongs to China. They're, we're gonna one day bring them back in. But since Taiwan has always had the back, you know, the United States has always had the back of, Ch of Taiwan, China has been reluctant to kind of do that. But now they seem to be flexing their muscles a little bit more because China is way stronger today than it was in 1949. But if you read that article for homework, you'll get more into those details. So the communists win, and Mao Zedong goes about transforming China in a very similar way to how uh, Vladimir Lenin and Stalin transformed the Soviet Union as a communist society. One of the first things he does is he takes over a really huge chunk of land. I'll show you a map in a second. A chunk of land called Tibet which is in an area just east of, sorry, west of China. The point is he engages in imperialism. Maybe somebody can remind me what imperialism means. Yeah, you take over land in another part of the world, right? So China in the 40s and 50s is a country looking to modernize itself, right? We saw how in the 1800s, China got its butt kicked in the Opium Wars. In World War I, even though they were on the winning side, still other countries are dictating terms to China and how they're going to behave. So now they're looking to modernize. So if you're gonna be an industrial society, it better have those natural resources. Like other communist leaders, he's going to reorganize how land works. Instead of you owning your own land, it's gonna be communism. So land owned by people will be seized by the government. It will now be government owned land and you would simply be a person allowed to live there. And they create these gigantic collective farms, right? Think about a giant piece of land owned by the government and instead of the peasants owning that land, they live there and they work collectively to grow food for their country. 
Okay, with the idea being if it's, a, if it's a large group of people working together, in theory, maybe you could produce more things. Instead of one person on the farm, it's a whole bunch. But we've talked about this. What, what typically happens in communist societies with regards to production of things? Like what often leads to lack of production? Yeah, right? People don't work so hard sometimes. If you don't get more money, the harder you work. And since in communism, they tried to try initially to create a classless society, you're not going to give people extra money for working hard. You're going to keep everything the same. So why would I go out there and bust my butt if no matter how hard I work, I'm going to get paid a similar amount? And if everyone has that attitude of, well, it doesn't matter how hard I work, people start to slack off. And if you slack off on fruit production in a country with a lot of people, you're going to have mass starvation. Okay, and we're going to get more into that tomorrow, how Mao Zedong's policies regarding land led to millions of Chinese people dying of famine. Not a great situation. Okay, the same thing happened in the Soviet Union under Stalin, right? The people in Ukraine specifically were like, no, no, we're not having this, right? And they destroyed their land and their animals on purpose as an act of resistance. Okay, like in all communist countries, you're going to have one person in charge. So Mao Zedong would be the Chinese dictator. And there's only going to be one political party allowed. The Communist Party led by one communist dictator. It's the same thing today. President Xi Jinping is the president of China, but he's also the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, and there are no other political parties that are legal. Okay, and there is no democracy in communist China.